women in medieval Islam. She's a history professor at the American University of Cairo. Women have always been neglected in history, so uh, not just as a woman, but also as a historian, I'd like to bring out what has been neglected, invisible, silent. I learn a lot from it because it explodes myths. Unfortunately, the sources that I use have been written by men expressing the patriarchal view of what is important. The army, the state, the bureaucracy, what my students call boring history. The womenhood of studies left no written records, so she looks for clues in the writings of medieval Islamic scholars. Huda figures out what women were really doing from the demands of the male scholars that they stop doing it. First of all, a woman should go out only for a necessity. If she does, she should go in long and unattractive garments. Sounds familiar. <laughs> a woman should walk close to the walls of houses in order to make way for men. Men should make the road difficult and narrow for women. As religious scholars, they viewed the female body as threatening to the order of the male world. The nudity of the female body is, is frowned upon. And this is a very sensitive subject on the part of our religious scholar because he hates women prancing in the public bath, you know, walking around nude, because they exchange domestic news about themselves, about their husbands, and uh, they competed among themselves in terms of, you know, like clothes and jewelry and what did my husband get. It was trouble for the man at home. I always encounter this in my research, you know, about women, that the female body in public space caused chaos. And again, I'm wondering whether this is not also a male retention of uh, the past, you know, when matriarchal power was expressed through the sexuality of the female. When the male revolted against that sexual dominance, he started taming it. Women's fertility made them powerful in the village times, but those times did not last. Around 5,000 years ago, a great change swept across the world. The era of the autonomous villages came to an end. Nobody really knows why, but in half a dozen places around the world, a new way of living arose. It was the point where human beings stopped just fitting into the world and began to subjugate it. In Egypt, in Mesopotamia, in China, in Central America, great numbers of villages were united under single rulers. Human beings invented the state, and patriarchy was born at the same moment. All the early states were pyramids of power and privilege with a single man at the top, a pharaoh, a god king, a sacred person. And how could a single man get so much power? Only by terror. The tombs around here belong to the kings and nobles of Egypt's first dynasty. They died about 5,000 years ago, so there's not much left of the tombs now except the outside walls of mud brick. But once the interiors were lined with inlaid cedar and filled with gold and ivory and all manner of precious things. And some of the kings may have been quite decent men when they were alive, but this is what happened when they died. They strangled scores or hundreds of the people who worked for the king, concubines, bodyguards, minor officials, servant girls, and buried them nearby to serve them in the next world. Around the tomb of Jer, the third king of unified Egypt, are the graves of 317 other people, the great majority of them young women. And these were not the king's enemies, they were people he knew. 
But murdering hundreds of people and burying them with the king is almost normal in the earliest kingdoms. Egypt, Mesopotamia, China, they all did it. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Welcome to civilization. But the terrible things they did had a purpose. Terror is a primitive form of mass communication. Put up enough images like this, and you don't have to station soldiers in every village. In Mesopotamia, the first civilizations soon became military empires that routinely impaled the citizens of conquered cities. The glorious soldier holding the severed head of his enemy became the human ideal. And women practically vanished from the record, except for laws destroying their freedom. Wives of citizens who go out on the street must veil themselves. Middle Assyrian laws, 1500 BC. One quarter of early Mesopotamian laws were about controlling women. The man wants to make sure that the, the, the children are his. And one way of doing it is to regulate you know, marriage and to say to the woman, you know, I have to control your movement. The legacy of Mesopotamia is still visible today in old parts of Cairo. The wealthier houses contain harems where women were segregated in order to prevent social contact with men who were not part of the family. Do you have this ideology in architectural form? The house is enclosed by high walls. The male space is on the ground floor so that there's easy access for the male visitors and the female spaces are on the upper floors where they could overlook these male spaces. served the purposes of secluding the women from strange male eyes. At the same time, it allowed women privacy to socialize without interference from the males. Segregating women and making them wear veils were just part of the process of turning women into private property. Women had to wear veils in Mesopotamia 4,000 years ago. So did respectable women in classical Greece and Rome. Women in medieval Europe were still veiling their hair. And even in our grandmother's time, women still wore veils on special occasions. Today, almost everybody has forgotten that the veil comes from an ancient upheaval that also brought us tyranny and endless war. But it does. Every state echoes the first state. Hierarchy, militarism, male domination. Today, in this great meeting place and throughout the land, we the people celebrate America. Please welcome President-elect Bill Clinton and Mr. Clinton, Vice President-elect Al Gore. Like anybody trying to run a mass civilization, Bill Clinton must get millions of people to pay taxes, work together, obey orders from a distant capital. That's so hard to do that until recently, all mass societies had to be dictatorships. But Bill Clinton doesn't have to be a dictator. He can actually try to talk people into cooperating because he has all the technology of mass communications available to him. Our country for the American people. To celebrate not a victory of party or persons, 
but the common ground we call America. But what was it like before mass media? Go all the way back to ancient Egypt 5,000 years ago. No human being has ever lived in anything bigger than a village. And suddenly, here we are in the world's first unified state. And we have a little problem, how to run it. Think of the number of people involved, 50,000, 100,000, half a million. And remember that the ancient Egyptians, the ancient everybody, lived in a world with no mass communications. No radio, no television, no books, no newspapers. Hardly anybody could even read and write. So they had no way to talk things over as a mass society, no way to reach a consensus, no way to agree voluntarily in what ought to be done. So somebody had to give the orders and everybody else had to obey. When we left the villages, we had to leave equality behind too. A mass society without mass communications has to be a dictatorship. But it doesn't have to go in for militarism, and it doesn't have to destroy women's rights. Egypt was one of the few ancient kingdoms where all the elements of patriarchy did not arrive at the same time. In fact, the early Egyptians, at least, accepted no more of the patriarchal order than they absolutely had to. The very first kings behaved quite badly, but mass society in Egypt did not become a permanent nightmare of exploitation and oppression. As soon as they could, the Egyptians moved away from the terror of the founding times. They even gave up building pyramids eventually and satisfied themselves with more modest temples. In fact, Egypt became the great exception a mass society that managed to keep a lot of the old village values. And women still had a place both in religion and in the real world. Before the coming of Judaism, Christianity and Islam, patriarchy was dominant, but it tolerated the presence of goddesses. So you, we see goddesses juxtaposed to gods in the religious ideologies. The earlier the period, the more dominant the female figure is. In Pharaonic Egypt, the queen legitimized the kingship of the ruler. In Egypt, women owned land and ran businesses. They moved freely in public and were close to being equal partners with their husbands. Occasionally, Egyptian women even ruled the country in their own right. Queen Hatshepsut reigned for 20 years and built this temple. She wore the customary fake beard of the pharaoh on ceremonial occasions, but the Egyptians, by and large, didn't seem to mind being ruled by a woman. Beneath these sands lies the city of Lahoum, briefly Egypt's capital over 3,000 years ago. Nick Millet, the curator of Egyptology at the Royal Ontario Museum, is overseeing the dig. The sharp contrast that has always impressed me is the difference between the status of women in Egypt and that in, shall we say, classical Greece. The ancient Greeks were a, a very peculiar bunch indeed, and they were basically terrified of their women folk. I don't say that lightly, I really believe this. If you will go over Greek mythology, you will find that almost all the monsters are female, and that must surely mean something. This did not happen in Egypt. A man had his women folk around him. This gives the whole court life a kind of a feminine quality. 
The art shows extremely fine linen garments on the women, through which the bodies show very clearly. Women's clothing particularly, which I have kind of an interest in at this time, does develop.